When I summarized and reviewed the first movie, a lot of people called me out. They said that Barry was time traveling, not universe traveling a lot of the time like I thought he was. That Helena was his new daughter and a homage to the golden age. That Flash and the guy from the Injustice League weren't in the Speed Force when they were running at the same time. And that the movie was simultaneously better than I had rated it, a 6.5, and that the series was worse than I rated it. While I still have some issues with these takes, these comments did make me think. Despite practically nobody watching it, everybody who has seen it seems to be incredibly, incredibly vocal about how they think about that movie and the next two movies especially. To the point where I was kind of like, wait, I want to be in the in crowd. Wait, I want to know what's going on. I want to have an opinion, you know? And I feel like you would also benefit from that too. That's why I will summarize and review Justice League Crisis on Infinite Earths part two, kind of rhymes, so that you can get involved without wasting your time and watching something for over an hour and I can be a part of the cool kids. And if you have time, check out my description. There should be something fun for you to do down there. Now, there's no context, there's nothing else, just the movie itself. Let's just get into the movie itself. Spoilers ahead though, spoilers ahead. Obviously I've covered the brand. If you want, if you want me to, you want me to talk about this brand, I will. But you've got to sponsor me, you've got to sponsor, you've got to sponsor. Let me just crack this open. Ooh. Crack this open, just for you. Could I be less cool? <laughs> oh, it's supposed to be a cool shot. But I just, made a mess. That's honestly a great representation of how this movie is gonna be. You think it's gonna be cool, all your expectations, you're praying for the best, but it ends up being a mess. So we open with the most random Batman fight known to man, okay? It's so random. <laughs> sure, it's the Joker and some rogues trying to destroy the magical world cosmic machine that they built, but it just leads to nowhere meaningful. And I, I literally, I don't. Oh, I know what it was. Bait. <laughs> it was bait. Okay, it's bait for extreme bat fan fans like me because in the middle of the fight, a bunch of the bat family, including Damien and Terry, pop up and they're like, "Hey yo, Ray, you need some of this bat back up." <laughs> But Bruce actually, because this is the one who doesn't have any memories of having a family. Again, this is the beginning of the movie. I don't know how this is relevant. Bruce basically says, I'm not gonna make minors help me out. I already have the IRS up my ass. I don't need CPS in my business too. And I honestly agree because who was Huntress and an older Dick Grayson as Robin helping when the Joker could sneak up behind them and knock them out? I mean, holy power scaling. Admittedly, I will say it's funny. And by funny, I mean cute. And by cute, I mean adorable that even though he's not their Batman they flock around him but what's more important and what's more relevant is that we find out that Barry is actually dead and that is our transition to more plot relevant scenes the first more interesting scene is this British villain telling his life story to some guy he's torturing let's call him Mr. Bot Stirrer because that's <laughs> That's what I think suits him best. Mr. Potter was a loner and loved reading pirate books over people. He was also a magical empath who could feel emotions from others and himself and sent them back stronger, even stronger. You feel sad, you'll feel sadder now because I'm taking your sadness and I'm amplifying it. That's kind of what he does. He can also amplify his own emotions and that comes in handy later. He unintentionally stirs the pot and causes his parents to hate each other more than ever he causes a lot of fighting and grabbing and stuff like that and we learned that eventually that is a turning point for how his parents treat him and where they want him we cut to krypton exploding you know simultaneously while this backstory is being told we're seeing the explosion of a, of a planet a famous planet we all know about because of one main guy but now in this situation the concern isn't that main guy but the main girl that follows after him this all happens under monitor's watchful eye and if you don't remember monitor is the interdimensional being whose task is to watch over the universe and make observations like a scientist in a way but not touching anything and he's part of a group people like a group of beings the monitors but this one actually is currently helping 
helping us to protect the universe from being destroyed basically so he's gone against his code here we see why essentially supergirl's ship slams into his view naturally monitor asks his ai his like robot to remove the distraction it's right in front of his view i don't want to see this random ship from this exploding planet that we just observed one amongst many exploding planets we observe but in removing the distraction the ai thinks bringing her on board would be a great way to do it monitor isn't pleased but she's out of the way and that's why it's important flashback to mr popster being sent to a boarding school and getting bullied relentlessly it's actually really cool i don't really like this, these scenes i mean i think they're well made and well written but they're uncomfortable to watch then we cut to monitor and his ai slowly but surely trying to bring supergirl out of her shock cara corel i think her name is Kara out of her shop. Then to Mr. Potster again, who eventually learns how to control his power to kill all that slighted him and to make the others who laughed or did nothing suffer as well. In contrast, we see a mentally stable Kara who realized that Krypton was destroyed while Monitor simply watched. And it rightfully pisses her off enough to find Kal El and Mr. Potster literally says, I like not in the next scene. <laughs> really like two contrasting characters the beginning made no sense it had no plot relevance it was really random the rogues are not necessary it's not a batman movie we don't see the rogues again i love batman so much and i love the bat family so much like this is not about me not liking them this is about doesn't make any sense <laughs> So this is what they should have started with because honestly this part was really good. After literally saying I like not, <laughs> Mr. Potsterer also makes his enemies cheer for him as they die. Made his allies sacrifice themselves to save he who became the pirate he always wanted to be as a child and even took over Atlantis and aligned them with Nazis. How do you make someone bad? In history, how do you make him bad? Make him a Nazi. Like, could have been a bit more creative it's too bad though that whole atlantis scene that marks the end of this flashback to back sequences and i i miss them because after that a shambles mate so mr potstara comes out of his flashbacks he's like okay you know what i think i got to the main points of my flashback how are you doing you know to the torture victim who we, we, we find out as the camera peers over to the side of the table is dr fate Mr. Pot story gets kind of excited, you know, he's like, you know, <laughs> when Dr. Spate basically just violates him and gives him the power to transverse universes, which at this point, when I'm watching the movie, I'm like, why? Do you know what I mean? Like, why give the guy who just tortured you the power? But then I was thinking, in Infinity War, you remember when Dr. Strange was like, all of the different universes only when i gave him the time stone did we win that's what i think happened let's just go with that all right we're back to kara we're back to her being pissed we're back to her leaving to go and meet kalel and also they summarize the legion of heroes movie which i have not seen it's in the tomorrowverse and i i haven't seen it i think someone said it might be good i don't know um i might watch it but essentially it's just kara meeting a bunch of people including this guy brainy who's like one of the brainy I don't know. he's just a guy who she likes and so we're flashing forward to Kara talking about what everything happened pissed as shit she's back because she was teleported forcefully by monitor to come back when stuff was happening simultaneously Mr. Potster yes I know they name dumped him as psycho pirate in the previous scene Mr. Potster sees Barry going fast he's like oh who the hell is that fast ass guy he runs away he tries to escape he's almost caught by Barry and the thing that saves him is fate's gift or whatever it was to transverse between dimensions and he ends up in a different dimension which was an office in German me bad time in Germany and is then summoned by Harbinger like everybody else was in the previous movie and finally like 20 or so minutes in we're back to where we were at the end of the first movie which is a long but admittedly entertaining tangent the whole league from different dimensions are basically checking when the continuous world destroying waves hit and activating the appropriate cosmic machines accordingly because Mary's gone you know one of the machines malfunctions and Clark and Kara are assigned to fix it but now this is roughly the halfway point of the movie Kara is distracted if you remember like I said her friend who she met the guy she kind of he doesn't exist anymore he's never existed anymore he's been wiped from reality 
reality. And so this friend now, who she had loads of travels with, told Monitor about, but now is gone. Of course, that's one of the things that's on her mind, as well as the whole, like, how do I treat Monitor right now? I kind of saw him as a father figure. How do I feel about him? Stuff like that. So she's distracted while her and Clark are supposed to, or Kal-El are supposed to fix this cosmic machine that is supposed to protect the planet that it is on from the multi-dimensional destroying waves. On another Earth, the last surviving human on an alternate Earth who appeared in a Superman slash Batman comic run that I've read. Yeah, so he's really cool. Super cool, interesting. Commandy, I think his name is? Was sent to an Earth, his Earth, without his permission. He's obviously like, hey, yo, I want to get off my Earth because this Earth is like apocalyptic. It's mad. It's crazy. It's spooky. He gets assigned to be with a gorilla. And the reason it's apocalyptic is it's run by these animals that have forced him to run and escape and hide his whole life. So obviously he doesn't trust this gorilla, but this gorilla is from a different dimension entirely. And the last man on Earth, he learns to accept and to trust somebody else just for a little bit while they man this cosmic machine. Then we're back to the satellite in the middle of nowhere where everybody is collated, yada yada yada. And we find that Mr. Potstirer has in fact been trying to nullify the mood and calm the mood of everybody there since movie one. So he was always there, we just hadn't really known about him. He says he's struggling with the task just so that he can manipulate the socially inept Monitor to give him more power. It's pretty obvious and pretty annoying but I guess Monitor is just not used to talking to people so he can't tell when he's being manipulated and at this point Monitor is pretty much indestructible so you don't necessarily worry but you kind of think ah this isn't gonna end well. Blue Beetle apparently knows that he's full of bull but Mr. Mr. Potstirer ends up stirring his negative emotions into something positive by the end of it. Before Mr. Potstirer is dragged in to this uh, black empty space by the anti-monitor who is a monitor who was a monitor for everything and now hates this monitor, promises Mr. Potstirer that if he stirs the pot and he he ruins monitor's plan, anti-monitor will give him the universe. So yeah, this is supposed to be the big villain that has been orchestrating everything wasn't in love with the concept but it was thought out to an extent so I was willing to give it a try. At the same time the think room, the geniuses, still peeved that Hawk Girl was in that room and not Batman but fine. They figure out that this attack is intentional. It's an actual attack. It's not just a natural phenomenon that's happening. How convenient that right after we figure this out the waves become these shadow demons who try to stop the cosmic machines from happening Happening. And Mr. Potstirer stirs the pot and projects anger. I kid you not, I actually kid you not, the heroes fight the shadows who Monitor figures out are the ones who are trying to destroy the universe as they knew it or the multiverse as they knew it. And the heroes do that using light, magic attacks that project light or emit light. And they didn't even write it cheesy, like they wrote it serious as if not realizing how cheesy and silly it was. The bats, including Luke, I think, you know, Batwing, appear to stop the fight or to, to contribute to the fight. And a Queen Hippolyta from another universe, she's aggressively sexist. She is aggressively sexist. Women can't be sexist to men. Uh, I would argue in the world where she rules the world and she uh, uh, keeps men in prisons across the world, yes. Regardless, she refuses to allow them to free the men so they can help and fight alongside them. And obviously the fight gets much harder when you have much less of the population fighting against the shadow demons on Diana's side on that planet. So yeah, we've got two fights so far, a few more, you know, but the thing is, even though the action sequences are good, oh my god, Diana using a lasso as a whip and the last human on earth, that guy, Commandy, whatever, his action sequences, some of these action sequences, oof, they were good. Even though that happens, Superman can't aim to save his life. Kara bumps into Mr. Potstirer and exhibits this lack of logic that the other heroes are also exhibiting at certain points, especially Monitor with giving Mr. Potstirer more energy when he was so obviously <laughs> sus. I mean, bro. And the same thing happened with Kara. He was staring. He was like, hey, don't you think this situation is kind of weird? And he actually stirs the pot enough to make her hate 
the man she had come to see as a father figure to the point where she's pissed as hell is what I'll say and I get it because she already had some resentment for him so it makes sense why she would start to feel like that but what doesn't make sense is her not being able to notice that she is being manipulated and combating that and questioning that do you know what I mean it's just silly on one of the earth's green lantern John Sewer confronts Constantine Constantine's on that earth as well and they scrap a little bit because Green Lantern thinks that Constantine has something to do with everything that's happening because he says that he might have foresaw this with Barry and Barry was talking about stuff and Spectre who appeared at the end of the last movie this being who also observed everything but from a magical point of view in different dimensions whereas monitors are actually in the same dimensions that these things happen seems to be observing monitor and tells him that he must basically pay for the cost of interfering with what's happened back to green lantern and constantine who are both still being affected by mr potser john says hi my name is john and then john says hi john my name is john mother and we get a stupid scene about that it's all pointless <laughs> and john constantine realizes suddenly who he is because he's like oh my name is john wait i'm john i'm john constantine you're also john i'm john stewart but i'm john constantine john you just reminded me that my name is john and when he does he cleans himself off everyone is fighting green lantern thinks oh I'll overcharge my shiny light battery and I'll throw it because light magic remember this light attacks whatever the fuck that means damage the shadow creatures and so Green Lantern naturally all my darkest days and my lightest light weapon <laughs> Don't think that's how it goes. He does his chant, he puts his ring in it, powers it up, and he throws it, which unnecessary. You could have probably charged the battery and thrown it without your ring, but he says, I wanted to make sure it blew up. Okay, now you have no fucking ring. Go away, you're gonna die. <laughs> like, you're powerless now. <laughs> But nope, he stays there. Oh, so silly. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and then after, you know, these people are still being affected by Mr. Potsdor, the Bat family, especially getting all pissed off, riled up, hurting each other. After they knock Bruce to the ground, Batman to the ground, and the demons start taking him away and start hurting him, they decide as a group, in an extremely cheesy manner, even under Mr. Potsdor's influence, that they're gonna help him. The demons retreat. And this vanishing starts here. I will say that Huntress... Helena saying dad again while Damien is right there and hasn't said father once and then Bruce getting up after being ambushed by a bunch of demons these these shadow demons who are who are, who are taking out people double his size without injury he just goes oh damn that hurt after they all just they they stole him they hit him like those two things made me a little irritated but you know I don't want to pick too much I just feel like there is a lack of logic here and I'm just pointing I'm just telling you the things that bothered me I'm just telling you the things that bothered me I'm not being overly picky I'm, I'm, I'm just saying I noticed it and it bothered me okay 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 we're almost there so the demons haven't actually like disappeared or retreated but they've more so relocated to earth one the where everything started prime earth as you heard prime earth earth one doesn't matter what you call it in this relocation they grow into one single large creature they attack this single creature with their light attacks what the f was vixen doing with this have i what what about i can turn into animals makes it so that you can shoot beams what animal can shoot a beam of light Explain us to me, what animal can shoot a beam of light? Anyways, pulling back out from the fight where this creature shadows is all in one big fat being who's just dench. Spectre and Monitor theorise that the cause of this event entirely actually is his initial interference. But what is his interference? Was it trying to stop the universe from de being destroyed and helping the others and the Justice League? No, his initial interference was like 20 years ago or whatever, 10 years ago with Kara, who he saved from Krypton. And then who comes in? Kara herself, after being manipulated by Mr. Potstirer. And she walks in and honest to God, <laughs> kills him. I will say, not the worst writing. I actually kind of rate it. <laughs> that was actually kind of good. <laughs> 
I kind of like that one. <laughs> we close with Kara getting a sudden flash of clarity as she realizes what she's done and the big shadow monster starting and preparing to launch its attack on the heroes on Earth 1. And the movie ends like that. I think I actually described this movie better than it was. Let it be known that while things happened and they sounded pretty good, and it was boring as sh It doesn't sound boring, but I'll explain to you in detail how it's boring. Honestly, I stand the wave cleaning up the mess, like the, <laughs> the multi-dimensional wave, just wiping the floor clean because I have so many questions about why they paced it and wrote it in this way. But for now, I'm gonna review what I do no. So ultimately I rated this a 5 out of 10. I rated the first movie a 6.5 out of 10 so there is a difference there but for good reason because this was definitely worse. There are two main reasons why this movie was worse. The first thing that was missing from this movie was a focus. The first 20 minutes of the movie except from the Batman scene was great you know it had a point it had a reason it was explaining backstories it was explaining a character and a relationship dynamic that we needed to know so we can watch this movie. And I can't even lie to you, I would actually rewatch just that part of the movies because it was so compelling and interesting. But then the problems arise. Notice how half of the time I would say we cut to this, we cut to that. We didn't see a focus after that. All we saw was constant referencing and reliance on the first movie and what they built. Yes, this is a sequel, yes. But nothing stood on its own two feet. Especially because we just got a different story an alternate story from the first movie so we needed something heavy something strong something directional to bring us forward from this to see why it lends into the second movie i cut a lot there were so many batman scenes there was wonder woman scenes and there were green lantern scenes for no fucking reason what would have been great and what would have helped this movie significantly is if we focus primarily on mr potster on kara and on monitor however frankly we got almost Almost less of them after the flashback even though that was entirely what the flashbacks were about because we got too many Bat Family scenes we got too many Wonder Woman scenes and we got too many Green Lantern scenes I think that without focusing on their POVs or certain characters POVs and motivations and journeys we were never able to find a crux to rely on or some direction to rely on it just felt like okay these are the super interesting characters super interesting relationships and then this is what's happening with the movie and slowly but surely we're gonna introduce bad things and random fight scenes and random uh, attacks and it it was just com a complete it was a complete mess compared to the first movie where Barry was literally at the focal point and compared to the first 20 minutes where there was an obvious build-up of problems a climax and then a reconciliation and then a build-up and then a let's return to present very easy to see very intentional the climax of the movie was so boring there was no proper build up there was no excitement in the scenes it was so lackluster but i'm gonna expand on that in the second point the second thing that was missing was the villain slash the conflicts this oh my gosh <laughs> so why should i care what happens to them i love these characters but even i didn't give a shit what was happening and i didn't feel tense or excited or sad most of the time of this movie and so i felt disconnected i felt bored i couldn't give a shit about it because if you think about it what were the villains you know the most untrustworthy obvious mr pot stirrer mr psycho pirate was supposed to be intimidating scary he was never allowed to be scary except from in the flashback after the flashback he was below everyone he was a joke you know if you think about it he manipulated Kara, sure but he was always under the whims of others and even with dr fate he got destroyed he got he wasn't even challenged from <laughs> dr fate and he got a power up by the guy he was torturing what like there was no way that i was going to be scared of him and that was a problem and that's similar for the anti-monitor the anti-monitor was too dis there was no impact you know there was no oh Oh, I'm scared of him. We couldn't even see him. We couldn't even see any cruelty he was doing. All that we were seeing of him was the army and the army wasn't scary either. They weren't hurting civilians. They weren't destroying things. They were just kind of on the front line and fighting the heroes. They were not even that big of a deal when you could just shine a torchlight at them. I mean, it was, it was silly. And then we move on to emotional engagement. So despite Mr. Potster being a literal evil empath, none of the characters experienced any depth of emotion 
after the flashback. I'm gonna talk about the flashback a hundred something times apparently. It was great. We got emotions, we got conflict, we got build up, we got tension, we got action from these flashbacks of both Kara and Mr. Potts Dara. Contrary to that, the arguments between the Bat family felt rudimentary. You know, the arguments between Kara and Monitor had some weight, but only because of the flashbacks. The tension and fear of the world's dying was barely felt. Even Diana. Diana going to meet Queen Hoppolita was a tangent that I think was done well because it wasn't that long. But we didn't see the depth of emotion from Diana. You know, no characters really cried. No characters really grinned and cheered when something good happened. No characters really collapsed with exhaustion. You know, there's just so many things that should have happened to bring us into the story to actually make us feel something. And these are the bare bone minimum things that most shows do. You know, if you watch a romance movie, you expect that you're gonna see them be cute. You're gonna see them feel something for each other. That's the basic point of these shows. Like these are minimal things you're supposed to do to make us engage. But by not having something as incredibly spooky in concept as a multi-dimensional ending foe and enemy impact them emotionally or even impact other people emotionally. We could have seen civilians with lives ahead of them and just dying in front of the wave. We didn't feel any of that. It just made the whole movie feel like we were playing with Legos or like nothing was really actually happening because nobody acted like anything was wrong and that was a crucial part of why I was not emotionally engaged by this movie at all really. The only time I could argue outside of the first 20 minutes maybe we felt it was Kamandi or the last human. He actually had quite a depth of emotion and I think that should have been everyone right? These characters all have that range but he seemed scared like he, he actually seemed intense and worried and fearful of what was happening. Maybe it was the voice actor in that situation but it was really good like I actually got brought into that scene. But the rest kind of felt bratty. I mean not to mention Green Lantern and the Bat family's arguments so surface level and half of them were Mr. Potstar's fault and uh, just empty. Maybe it was the art style, the animation, the directors or the voice actors but overall there was a lack of tension throughout and that maybe even more than the lack of focus is why this movie sequel sucked and why it wasted its potential. If you want to do one thing and subscribe otherwise and let me know what you thought about this summary and review let me tell me if you want me to do the same for movie three then i say okay goodbye and you're living in the city you know you have to survive living in the city you've got to keep that dream alive when everything is free can't you see living in the city you've got to keep that dream alive